The youth of today are at a crossroads. They are digital natives navigating uncharted waters. A devastating pandemic, social polarization, economic pessimism, and issues like climate change are deeply troubling youths. We are living in a very volatile, uncertain, ambiguous world. We are all growing up and having the same struggles like mentally and stepping into the adult life, trying to negotiate your identity and figure out like your purpose in life. Mm. And then the question about misinformation, fake news. How do you even trust information online? Fake news, folks. Fake news. The rise of misinformation, fake news and cyber fraud have added to the climate of suspicion and fear further eroding the bedrock of trust. Clear, right or wrong. These situations have a strong potential to sow discord as well as to build deep mistrust on other people, other groups of people, the governments, the institutions, certain communities and even your family members themselves. While Singapore ranks as a high-trust country, given the impact of these factors on youths here, is trouble looming on the horizon? Are we headed towards a crisis of trust? Trust is the cement that binds society and communities. It is what allows us to coexist, to work, play and live together. Without it, what would become of us? Join me, Das, as we find out how Singaporean youths feel about this important yet complex concept. Trust. The mind of a cheerleader is filled with many thoughts of twists and turns, of catches and leaps. But always lurking at the back of their minds is fear, something that must be cast aside to allow for complete trust. How do you all actually develop trust for someone? Because there's always this lurking thought in my mind that what if someone is not doing their job properly? Trust doesn't just happen like, OK, I trust you and I'm just going to do it. And of course, you start with progressive steps, then we build up to something higher. So it builds confidence along the way. So you take like small steps and eventually um, you'll be able to achieve a lot of the more difficult and advanced stance. But what are the obstacles or real consequences that can take place if there is lack of trust in the team? Injuries can occur, such as fractures, needing hospital visits. We all feel guilty if we accidentally you know, hurt each other. But ultimately, I believe that we all know that we have to trust each other again in order to avoid these injuries from occurring again. <laughs> Okay, let's try. Five, six, seven, eight. Wait, wait, wait. One, wait. <laughs> seven, eight, and one, two. Eight, and one, two. two. Stand up. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hi. Hi, I'm Das. Hi, I'm Das. Just swipe up. Just swipe up. Hi, I'm Das. Just swipe up. I'm Das. Being able to speak four languages has opened many doors for me in show business. But what's been attracting a lot of attention is my online presence. What? Not for Doscon. My material is a response to life around me. Please reach out to me and we can start a business together. And a large part of my audience is the youth who relate to what I say and seem to trust me. There is no relationship in the world, even the cyber world, that can thrive without trust. Trust is also the most valuable asset for social institutions like business, governments, NGOs and media. But trust is declining in many countries, according to the 2023 Adelman Trust Barometer Global Report. We found that there is a lack of trust in institutions out of 28 countries surveyed. The challenge and risk of that is that a crisis in trust in institutions could potentially lead to a crisis in interpersonal trust as well, which could lead to polarization in society. Polarization happens when a growing sense of distrust begins to divide communities, creating a fragmented society and isolating groups of people. 
When we look at societies with low trust, I think uh, this is where you see a lot of fissures in society. There will be no societal progress. Their basic functioning will be affected. It will be very difficult for different groups of people with different backgrounds to work together. You can have social friction that lasts for a long, long time, making cohesion just simply impossible. How much trust people have in their societies, institutions and governments varies from country to country, community to community. But what remains constant is the increasing scrutiny of an increasingly vocal young generation. That you can be small and still be a giant. I spoke to eight Singaporean youths with different backgrounds and experiences to find out exactly what trust means to them. I guess for me, trust is I trust that the person don't mean me any harm, but more than that, I trust that I'm emotionally safe with this person. I don't see just trust as black and white. I see trust more of a spectrum. Mm. So my baseline trust, I feel some generic sense of safe and that I trust that you have my best interests mm -hmm. at heart. I think for me, um, it's very important that someone is genuine. Mm. So if they are very showy about their accomplishments, I would hope that they are as honest about their struggles. Trust has to be earned. But how trusting are Singaporeans towards strangers in their midst? In a study conducted by the Institute of Policy Studies, Two-thirds of respondents felt they had to be very careful when dealing with people, especially when meeting them for the first time. But is it really so hard to elicit trust? If we are talking about at first sight, right, when I see a stranger, I don't think Singaporeans are going to say immediately that I trust that person. Trust means having the ability to suspend your suspicion or judgment about the other party and deciding that it's okay to interact with them. Kimberly Quack is careful of who she trusts. Diagnosed with a hearing disability when she was one, she has always struggled to make friends. Painful experiences growing up have made her wary of people. For years, I just did not have friends. When I went to some people, they would just stop talking and they wouldn't even engage with me. So it was very lonely, very painful. For example, I thought I had a friend, so this person was my classmate. The person would always help me with things and check in on me. So I thought, yes, I have a friend in school. But actually, it turned out that the person was using me to get to a work. The person was just helping me so that the person had shown to the teachers, to the staff that they should be acting to a work. After the person got the the amount they just have on them. So it was no dancing experience. Being deaf hasn't stopped Kimberly from achieving her dreams. She's a life sciences undergraduate and a competitive bowler. But even at 23, Kimberly is still careful about who she trusts. As someone who, who has hearing loss, how do you think, as hearing people, we can understand and maybe respect you guys better? Genuinely, I must say, it is simple. Just make the effort to engage with someone who has hearing loss. It doesn't have to be very effortful, such as out of the way to learn sign language. Instead, it can be small gestures like, let's say, if you notice that the person with your nose has difficulty understanding you, 
but the person does not show in practice this infinity. So the same person would try to at home and and just be cognizant of how the interaction is progressing and then that is really enough for us. While physical appearances or behaviours may initially influence our decisions about who to trust, it is our personal experiences that truly shape our perceptions. Through our unique life journeys, we accumulate experiences that shape our understanding of trust. Positive encounters build bridges, reinforcing our belief in the inherent goodness of others, while negative experiences can lead to scepticism and caution. Some people are less trusting than others, but this, experts say, is not a bad thing. So there is a perception, and I will add a, probably an incorrect one, that you for younger people today are less trusting than people who are older and so on. Perhaps younger people or more educated people or people who are more connected with more exposure, who have travelled and seen different perspectives, have more questions. So they are conditional. People are expecting and demanding information. Until and unless they get it, they remain in a state of, well, I'm not sure yet whether to trust you or not. And that is the kind of uh, healthy uh, scepticism that we actually want. Okay. So, if healthy scepticism is a common attitude among youths, what would allow them to trust someone? I guess for me, trust is I trust that the person don't mean me any harm. It's very important that someone is genuine. It's how you put yourself forward in the context and in the situations that determine how much I can trust you. I genuinely trust, I give the trust to people because I trust myself. So I like to give it 100% trust um, in the first impression. But of course, yes, it's contextual because over time, then you start to see the true colours of the person and you see whether can you really trust this person. It's clear that for many youths, the act of giving trust is something that must be carefully considered. Once granted though, it is fragile. So what happens when that trust is broken? Can it be repaired? We'll explore this after the break. There is no one-size-fits-all guide to help youths navigate their way into adulthood. Aldrich Jai is a youth worker. He knows how fear and anxiety about the future can morph into trust issues, resulting in teenage rebellion. I'm one of those kids that I grew up really rebellious, mm. so really angry kid. Uh, so I was sent to Boys Town mm. when I was like 12. Us, right? For four years, Eldridge lived at Boys Town, a charity that cares for children and youth at risk. The organisation also runs an outreach programme. Eldridge, now 29, has been working with them for seven years. Discussed yeah. upon meeting who tomorrow? Uh, another uh, youth ah, organisation. Okay, okay. He leads a team helping troubled youth rebuild their trust in people and to reconnect with the world. When I was growing up, at the toughest period, I didn't let anyone in. You know, and I'd be like, nah, I don't want to talk to you, nah, I don't want to talk to you. I want to be a tough guy. And then they're like, cool man, anything, I'll be here. And then next week, they do the same thing. Next week, they do the same thing. Next week, they do the same thing. Then I realised, like, oh, they're, they're there. I might as well get this off my chest, right? And then I realised, oh, I can share more. Then Nick, Amanda, you can close. Late into the night, Eldridge and his team venture out. They look out for youth to engage with, offering a listening ear to anyone in need. And it's quite concerning because sometimes, you know, like that's how we, we know this is the group that we want to engage. Mm. Because ultimately, if you're in your school uniform, you end school at 2 mm. and you're here till like 10 pm, what about dinner? Yeah. You know? So, so I've met with some like. But I'm sure there are youths who refuse to share. And it may be very hard for them to trust a complete stranger. How do you actually get them to trust you? I think uh, trust is a very core component mm. in the work we do. Uh, our main goal when we first meet these young people mm. that we meet on the streets mm. for the first time is never like, OK, tell me all your problems. Because mm. right? that's not going to work. Mm. And also on our end, we don't know the problems that these young people may face. And just doing that is just traumatic in itself. Mm. 
So what we do is uh, we follow this sort of like flow where we focus on building rapport first, mm -hmm. focus on building trust. And that's typically the, like a standard... Many youths he encounters are guarded and suspicious. But as they begin to trust Eldridge and his team, they feel less isolated. Different stuff, uh, different and as experience has shown, this sense of connectedness helps them to reintegrate and contribute to society. I look at it as if you... I think that's just the most important thing for me, mm. to allow the youth to know that, hey man, like, there are people you can trust, there are people that are out there for you, and for them to be able to have this sort of sense of hope that the world is going to be a better place. Yeah, but like, for example, if let's say you're an artist, then I'm going to... There are many benefits to having a high-trust society, so that can include, you know, people become more connectedness, we have a more welcoming society, but it also can have knock-on effects, uh, for example, to the economy, because people are more likely to work better with people that they trust, and it can help to uh, grow the country together as well. This is where you, for other reasons, find a way in which to connect with people who are not like yourself. So uh, it would be, um, you know, a connection that's not based on common age or gender or ethnicity or that you come from a similar school. You actually cross boundaries, which we think are important, to make friendships and do things together. Can youth cross boundaries and build friendships to rely on each other, or even trust one another? Does looking different matter? On a personal level, I do not hold, like, in terms of how you look, what you wear, what you do, I don't really care. Like, you can be tattered from head to toe and have like 20, 30 different piercings and all. I would still trust you. If I feel that the vibe from you is good, I would still trust you. There was like a phase, I guess, Back it's still in school, like in university, college and stuff, where I need to earn trust from people mm. because of me wearing hijab. So there's a lot of say, skepticism, you know, in class, people don't want to sit beside you. People, you sit beside them and they'll just look at you up and down like, why are you here? So that phase of earning trust, I think, I didn't see it coming, I would admit that. Uh. I thought we would have come to a point where we are able to just embrace each other. Looking at generalised trust, it's actually a way for us to understand how the society at large uh, is like. So um, whether there's you know, some kind of um, connectedness between the society, it is also a measure that helps us understand more about social capital in general, which is uh, more of community building. Social capital can be thought of as mutually beneficial interactions in society where people act in a way that benefits others and expect others to do the same. A country's social capital is strengthened when its social networks are diverse. That's when people can befriend, trust and rely on others who are different to them. To find out how diverse social networks are among our group of eight youths, we conducted a mini-survey. Among our group of youths, 35% of Thais are gender diverse. 38% of Thais are inter-ethnic. But only 23% of Thais cross education levels. And 21% of Thais cross housing types. These results mirror the findings from a 2017 Institute of Policy Studies survey of 3,000 respondents. What our survey indicated is that there is a healthy level of friendships that cross age and gender, a moderate and positive level of friendships and support across race, across religious groups. But I think the third set of findings told us the social ties were weakest across the boundaries of those who live between public housing and private housing and across the boundaries of people who declare that they've got non-elite school background and those who have elite school backgrounds. So there's that class divide. We tap on the strengths of individuals from under-resourced communities to co-create and co-run... In this neighbourhood, community guides like Lydia Susianti lead a series of trails in hopes of bridging this divide. Probably they 
I'm very proud of myself. So I've been living here for nine years now, uh, living with the family of seven of us. Uh, so I have five kids now. Lydia's community is a diverse and connected one, made up of residents with varying income levels. She shows how connections are made in the neighbourhood and how trust could blossom among neighbours. Most of the kids in the neighbourhood will actually come here and play. So this is where I see kids from all these rental blocks, which I know some kids are actually troubled. I just need to check on them, like, whether you know, they are eating well, whether they are okay, is there any bruises on them. So I think because of that, um, I build trust with them where they actually can come to me and tell me anything. Um, you know, what really inspires... How can people come together? I would say where there are commonalities. For example, like what Lydia said, you sit down on the playground, there are mothers. It doesn't matter whether you're a mother from, you know, you are, you are a new resident mother, you are a mother living in a condo there, you are a mother living, you know, uh, in a block here. Sometimes it, it, all it takes to start a conversation, hey, how old is your kid? Very cute, you know, and then, then take it from there, right? I'm not saying that everything will blossom into lifelong friendship, but it takes the first step, which is to look around you and say, hey, hello. This resilience tour is the brainchild of Poa Huijia, who runs Skillseed, a social enterprise. She wants to tap on the strengths of under-resourced communities to build connections between different segments of our society. And at the core of these connections lies trust. Why is trust so important in the community in the first place? Trust is like oxygen. You don't really think about it until something bad happens. So let me give an example, right? At, at a neighbourhood scale, right? Let's say your grandma falls down in the home and you happen to be out. You want her to think immediately, oh, I'll just shout very loud and our neighbour asking will come and save me and bring me to the hospital and all that. And you come back and, you're, and, and you know that your, your grandma is safe. We don't want our grandmas to fall down and like, well, I better not shout because I, you know, the untrustworthy neighbours, they'll come in and rob me blind while I'm immobile. I will just try to help myself and then six hours later, they're in a coma. Yeah. Right? And imagine if it happens at this scale, right? And then the consequences are, are, are really bad. Yeah, yeah so, so it's so important because like oxygen, you don't know, you just breathe, 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 but when you cut off oxygen, yeah. consequences are drastic. So we, we need trust. It is the fuel for, for really the future. My kids can have different kind of books and library is quite a decent way. I've walked away from the tour realising that trust between individuals and towards society as a whole is a work in progress. But there are several dimensions to trust and my journey to learn about it is far from over. Like how much trust do youth have towards their government and other institutions? Yeah, I mean, boom, if they start asking me. What we are looking at here is increasing inequality. There should be more mental health awareness in schools. How do we reshape or redefine how we view success at the end of the day? We are united on the... I just needed a friend. Step with me into the world of youth-led drama. Using the technique of forum theatre, these actors stage real experiences of oppression to explore issues important to their generation. It's all over Instagram, TikTok. It's what everyone has been talking about for the past few days. Some of the subjects they tackle are ugly, hidden, and difficult to talk about. I need to not make that report. Why not? I said no, and you still touch me. <laughs> I didn't mean it that way, Sarah. I have done poverty, teen rebellions, family negligence, drug abuse, and most recently, sexual violence. So, a boyfriend? Ah? Ma, she's still young. La. Just go for By addressing social taboos, these actors hope to promote <laughs> trust and open conversation. Now what? Both throw your future away. Abagosa! Ma, they want youths to get comfortable talking about uncomfortable things and in doing so, to empower change. I wanted the both of you to be perfect. Now look at us! Ma, I'm sorry, I tried, but... So I have to make the story as realistic as possible, as 
I want the audience to feel what I feel. I want them to try and change my life or change the perspective of the scene. I think it takes the simplest question to, to start a conversation on anything. Sometimes within a group of friends, you can talk about anything because you feel comfortable with them, right? There's the trust. Same thing here. We're trying to build rapport, we're trying to build trust. We're going to do a small check-in right now. We're going to tell us our names. And... Theatre allows different perspectives to be shared in a non-confrontational manner. It's one of many ways to engage Singaporean youth to express themselves, something the government wants to encourage. Eliminate me! Increasingly, we will have to find ways to get Singaporeans to engage one another. In this new troubled world, it is all the more important for us to close ranks. Divided, we stand no chance. The trust between our political leadership and people and between Singaporeans themselves is a key strength we must continue to nurture and cherish. In so many societies, this has gone wrong. Trust is the key to a united society, especially during difficult and uncertain times. But a recent study found that almost 6 out of 10 Singaporean youth believe that the social fabric which once held their country together has grown too weak to serve as a foundation for unity and common purpose. So what are the things that divide us, Amalina? The recent issues and conversation and discourses around the LGBTQ community. And also I feel we're always on the fence or torn uh, things with regards to foreigners, for, foreign workers or migrant workers. Things that pertain to us as Singapore citizens, say cost of living, mm. say education, housing, these are actually things that unite us. I think the issues that divide us are the ones that capture headlines and capture the media and all our attention. But there are a lot more things that unite us. Where I think it divides us is when we define our identity. And so when we focus very much on defining what we are not and what we disagree with, that's where the conflict arises because you are infringing on someone else's identity and you are preventing them from being who they fully are in society. Tolerance, respect and understanding are the foundations of a multicultural Singapore. However, a surprising statistic indicates that more than two-thirds of 18 to 34-year-olds would not help, live with or work with someone who strongly disagrees with their point of view. I think it's important to understand that uh, sometimes what we say may not be what we do, right? So yes, two in three say that they may not work with others because they're different from me. It doesn't mean that they will not, okay? So I, I think we need to understand that perceptions may not lead to actions. So we need to take it with a pinch of salt in, in a way. But yes, I think that's indicative that society is more predisposed towards polarization. Polarization could be detrimental things to society, like worsening prejudice, discrimination, slower economic development, and also even violence in the streets. The more polarized a country can be, we see that that even further deepens distrust and fear, and the behavioral impact of that could lead to, again, more polarization. So that is that vicious cycle. Singapore is among a handful of countries that continues to record low levels of polarization according to the Edelman Trust Barometer. But this should not be taken for granted. We are a generation that spends much of our lives online. Social platforms and digital media can feed polarisation and erode trust. Certain social media platforms provide news or cater news that are niche to a specific group based on their own positions and their own likes and their own opinions on a certain issue and start to provide them information that pertains or that, that is only relevant to their position on a certain issue. Mm. So that is from an algorithm or machine-driven kind of reason as to why online polarisation can occur. What we tend to see among younger Singaporean users specifically, right, on what type of content actually that kind of creates polarisation is on things or issues that are perceived to be in violation of justice, social justice, human rights, specifically on race and racism. 
Divisive content tends to spread rapidly and widely. More than 6 out of 10 Singaporeans observed increased polarization of views online in the last five years. Social media in, in some situations does increase that polarization. We may have heard of things like echo chambers, where we tend to join interest groups and we tend to hang out uh, with people who are uh, similar to us. Make a life of their own issues such as... Uh, you can just ask echo chambers amplify one's views by feeding biased information on topics and issues, while simultaneously rejecting contrasting perspectives. The problem is this information might not be authentic, might not be trustworthy. And with constant exposure of the same views and coupled with very worrying or very triggering and very strong misinformation that can be very emotional triggering, these factors or these situations have a strong potential to sow discord as well as to build deep mistrust on other people, other groups of people, the governments, the institutions, certain communities, and even your family members themselves to a certain extent. However, Singapore has remained steady in maintaining social cohesion through various government initiatives. For instance, Singapore's public housing policy aims to promote racial integration by allowing residents of different ethnicities to live together and interact on a regular basis. The second platform that was designed specifically to bring people of difference together with a common goal, securing the defence and the safety of Singapore. And this is, of course, national service. I think that, in general, it does bring people of diverse backgrounds together, whether it's race or religion or school backgrounds. Policies like these implemented at a national level have worked to instill trust and confidence in the government. Singaporean youth feel the same way as older citizens in the way they trust institutions. The government is the most trusted, followed by NGOs, businesses and the media. So interestingly, Singapore is one of those fortunate and rare societies where you find that trust level is very high. In the 1960s and 70s, right, if you were to do your survey back then, um, people were not very trusting of the police and in some sense even the leaders. Why? Because there were obvious uh, a competence problems. There, there were secret societies then, there were gangs, you know, there were floods easily and problems don't get solved and all. So it was actually when, when problems get solved, when secret societies, gangs, uh, criminals, crime rates go down, when police forces become more professional, when leaders solve your problems of slums and you start building good HDB flats that are attractive and affordable, when healthcare becomes something that is of good quality and yet affordable, then trust increases. So through lived experiences, the behaviours of the leaders, the public servant, the police forces, trust then was gained. While trust levels in Singapore remain high, so too do high levels of uncertainty. Really care about being judged. Yeah, it's just yeah. What we are looking at here is uh, increasing inequality. And I think we have to come to terms with the fact that social mobility in Singapore is decreasing. I think in the midst of providing basic necessities, it also has to come along with all these soft things. Like, there should be more mental health um, awareness in schools. One of the issues that I think sort of, I wouldn't say not make me trust, or maybe shaken, or be, be a bit more unsure, is the part of education. How do we reshape or redefine how we view success at the end of the day? Of all those unnecessary stress that being brought upon by education, by the parents, and by the governing bodies. Yeah, so that I feel that as a parent or us, right, we are the first teacher that our kids should, should have. We should teach them about trusting themselves. We should teach them about not letting society determine who you are going to be in the future. Jason Chua is a restaurant owner who trains aspiring chefs in his spare time. Uh, you put this on inside here. He believes Singapore's education system prepares students well for high-skilled jobs. But more help is needed for those looking for different job opportunities. It's okay. I go to school probably because it's fun. But trusting the education, I've never really trusted it. How do you feel like the Singaporean education supported you or prepared you for the future? 
I mean, our education system has always been an education system where you are being spoon-fed to face situations that are being thrown at you, but the solution is uh, SOP. That's how our education system is being brought up. But this scenario, right, it doesn't work for people who are self-employed entrepreneurs because when you start to have face your own issue when unforeseen circumstances, right? Uh, then you messed up so badly. Because of you, we slow down. All right, right. I feel that the education system should throw you more real-life problems. And the teachers and the educators should respect the problem-solving skill of a certain individual rather than tell them that, no, you cannot do this, you should do this, this, this. I feel that educators should actually allow kids to present their own ideology of solving things. There are no doubt many challenges faced by today's youth. Rising cost of living, rapidly advancing technology and an ever-evolving work landscape are just some of the issues they grapple with. Singapore's youth want to be engaged and represented as they seek to build their present and future. You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words, and yet I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. It was this speech that brought about an awakening within Rishika Selvan. At 19, she is one year younger than environmental activist Greta Thunberg. Like her role model, Rishika wants to challenge people to take immediate action to reverse climate change. I also deal with a lot of like anxiety and a lot of like frustration and a bit of like sadness when I think about climate change, right? Because previously when we used to talk about climate change, we would see it as a very like long-term issue. But now we're seeing like the impacts, right? We're seeing like natural disasters, we're seeing like people from neighboring countries getting displaced from their homes. And it's only showing like that the impacts are gonna get worse and worse over time. So I feel like as a youth, I guess I have to think about like the future and about like how it's gonna impact me and other everyday people, like how's it gonna affect my family and stuff. A study revealed that Singapore's youth are concerned with the same issues older citizens worry about. Climate change is one of their top concerns, along with job loss and inflation. To the degree that we need them to do so. Climate change is such an overarching issue that bleeds into every aspect of our lives. Us as individuals do not have as much power as the government to enact far-reaching enough um, policies or to do enough to really change the system from a fundamental level. So I understand that it's a very huge topic, but we are on a really huge time crunch here. And if we cannot trust our governments to solve this, then who else can we trust? Mm. In 2022, a survey asked youth to rank what they thought would be most effective in mitigating the effects of climate change. The majority believed government policies play the biggest role. The question is, how does one speak to the state? That is the question. And there need to be more channels for that, to be able to say, look, if young people um, are distressed, how do they speak back to the government? to be able to say that uh, structural change needs to happen, but also avenues for political action to make that happen, right? Rishika Selvan and her team want to do just that. She is part of Singapore Youth for Climate Action, an advocacy group that promotes environment-related volunteerism. I think for youth and government, like something that SYC has been working on is trying to provide youth with the opportunity to kind of engage with government stakeholders and kind of like have that conversation and bring that conversation forward, right? But before that, we want to like educate youth and we kind of like want to share more about how they can get involved in parliamentary making processes. Most people can be pessimistic, but I'm actually quite optimistic about it because I feel that at some point of time, this negative energy will be actually can actually be transformed into something very positive. So that's actually something that happened to me because I, I was previously very anxious about it, I was upset about it. And I, I know that I wanted to do something that can make a change. 
future uncertainties definitely would, would affect trust. I think society as a whole and the government as a whole passed a big trust test uh, during COVID. I think uh, there's a lot more wellspring in, in, in terms of trust. But Singapore, as you know, is a small country and we are very vulnerable uh, to international geopolitics and uh, economic situation. Uh, this year, it doesn't look too good. Economy is not growing as fast. We have heard about technology companies and a whole host of other companies retrenching workers, which means that they are hiring less. So I think the fundamental bedrock of trust is there. But I think after a while, if opportunities are dwindling, uh, for example, I think trust may be eroded uh, slowly. But I think we are really at a position of strength. I think that trust in government in particular is the kind of trust that needs to be earned and then maintained. So even if now we see high trust in government, it cannot be a, that good an indicator about whether things will remain the same in the future. So how could that trust be earned and maintained among the youth of today? It could start with having youth play a bigger role in shaping the country's future, uncertain as it may seem. Younger Singaporeans are a very different animal to the older Singaporeans. Their sense of um, uh, citizenship, their desire to be active in the governance process is different from how the older Singaporeans envisage their role. So we want leaders to be trustworthy, leaders want us to trust them, but we as the members of public trying to get involved also need to get the trust of those who are delegated with power or elected to power to make decisions. Because we are asking them actually to let us be part of this decision making that they are elected in a way for. Right? So, so, so in, in some sense, they have the responsibility, they are now involving us and giving us that responsibility and then you need to be trustworthy. Building trust with the youth has been a priority of the Singapore government for many years. There is an increasing demand by the youth to be consulted and engaged in decision-making processes. So that we can participate with our frank views. But are discussions and dialogues enough to build trust between the youth and the government? I think for some of us, it does become a bit more fatigue mm. where we don't see like any follow-ups or any tangible outcome to mm. that. But also, we do see the need to constantly have these things. But I think it needs to go beyond just having dialogue. Trust is a two-way process and, you know, the, as much as we are trusting the government to take action and everything, the government should, I mean, the government's obviously trusting us to do something as well. I think often in these dialogues, it is comforting that our voices are heard, but there is not enough feedback and there is not enough a sure structured way to ensure that this feedback has turned into an action or a policy. Some youths express that their opinions may not be generally taken into consideration in dialogues. To address these sentiments, youth panels are being established to develop policy recommendations with the government. Youth panels will not just be another dialogue or not, and not just be another focus group discussion, but it will be policy-centric and outcome-driven, working together with shared information to study a national issue that concerns young people today and propose a policy fix. The government on its part has recognised that desire among citizens to want to play a role in not just commenting, but crafting and implementing things that are good for society, okay, that all parties can agree is helpful. And people trusting the government one step at a time to say they want to hear us, they want to take into account how we think this is best done, and they trust us to give us some resources to actually do it. Nisha Rai sees the value in working with the government. She is the co-president of Safe NUS, a group that hopes to protect students from sexual harassment. I take a step on my of social media platforms. Nisha recently joined the Sunlight Alliance for Action. It's a government initiative bringing together individuals, groups and government agencies to come up with solutions to make the online space safer. These kind of initiatives are better when there's more people in it because you 
get to understand everybody's perspectives and there's also it also allows for trust to be worked on and to be increased simply because there's many more stakeholders who are in it and it's not something that becomes an echo chamber where it's only me who's constantly speaking or somebody else constantly speaking. You don't overnight have trust that all these stakeholders will hear you and be of the same mind overnight. But you try out little steps from conversation to identifying a common purpose, to generating a common project, to enforcement or delivery, and certainly policy change. So if there's one thing that I would like to summarise, and that is trust is fragile, but when dealt adequately, when approached adequately, it is extremely powerful in a positive way. Today's youth are stressed, if not fearful, about the future. To them, the world is chaotic and uncertain. Trust that the person don't mean me any Some generic sense of safe. What they crave is trust and stability in the face of profound challenges. While they are prepared to take a stand and make a difference, they search for harbours to anchor their trust. And so it is important for them to have the space to do just that, so that they can flourish today and into the future.